Hey, everybody. This is the final episode of 2022. We'll be back with new episodes the first week of January. So in the meantime, enjoy this episode. Catch up on the ones you missed this year and sign up for my weekly newsletter at historyasithappens.com. Happy New Year. History as it happens, December 15th, 2022. Putin problems. In Russia today, the clear winner of the Russian presidential election, Vladimir Putin, began to establish the Putin era. Russia is not the enemy of the United States. Here in Bucharest, we must make clear that NATO welcomes the aspirations of Georgia and Ukraine for their membership in NATO. Russia's decision to send troops into Crimea has rightly drawn global condemnation. After months of preparations, the Russian President Vladimir Putin has launched a major military operation against Ukraine. Tonight, a major victory for the Ukrainians in what could be a turning point in this war. He might be leading his nation to defeat in Ukraine, but it doesn't look like Vladimir Putin will be evicted from his throne in the Kremlin. Russia's autocrat maintains his grip on power despite the disastrous performance of his armies. Is there any way out for Russia? Well, yes, but it's tricky because Putin's problems are Russia's problems, and that means they're our problems too. And that's next as we report History As It Happens, a podcast from The Washington Times. I'm Martin DeCaro. Rather than change course, however, President Putin has doubled down, choosing not to end the war, but to expand it. Now that they are involved in this conflict, even if they have certain doubts about uh, how much sense it makes, uh, they don't want their country to be humiliated. So they're prepared to stick it out for a while no longer. And only if the situation gets radically worse over the next several months do I think you begin to see some thinking about how we move away from Putin and perhaps put the country on a different course. In early November 1989, a truly historic event led to pure astonishment and jubilation in Berlin. Astonishing news from East Germany, where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. Good evening, live from the Berlin Wall on the most historic night in this wall's history. Communist leaders have now taken a symbolic sledgehammer to that wall. It's conceivable, I suppose, now that the wall... And about four weeks later, with the wall open and the East German regime collapsing, historian Mary Elise Serrati, in her book Not One Inch, writes of a KGB lieutenant colonel stationed in Dresden who was not celebrating. He called a colleague with the Soviet military forces there. The lieutenant colonel wanted armed support as protesters drifted freely across the city. But the person who answered that call refused to grant the lieutenant colonel's request without permission from Moscow. And Moscow was silent. As Serrati says, those words would haunt the KGB officer for years. His name? Vladimir Putin. It is well known by now that Vladimir Putin viewed the collapse of the Soviet Empire and the USSR itself as a geopolitical catastrophe. And by waging war over the past two decades in Chechnya, Georgia, Crimea, the Donbass, and now for all of Ukraine, Putin has sought to restore Russian power and influence. And some say that's been his goal from the start, despite words to the contrary, as in this, his very first speech to the Russian people as head of state in late 1999. He promised to protect civil liberties and freedom of the press because Russia, in his words, has opted for democracy and freedom. That was a long time ago, wasn't it? Well, recently on this podcast, we've been talking about how power works in autocracies in China and Iran, and in general. Today, we're going to focus on Putin in the context of his war of aggression in Ukraine, a war that looks increasingly unwinnable if winning means reaching Kiev and turning Ukraine into a vassal state. Russia tried and failed to do that months ago. But despite his epic miscalculation, Putin still has the backing of Russia's elites, his power base. Thomas Graham is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. He's a co-founder of the Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies program at Yale. He was a special assistant to the president and senior director for Russia on the National Security Council staff from 2004 to 2007. During that time, he managed a White House Kremlin strategic dialogue. In other words, he knows Russia as well as any of the guests who've been on the podcast since the war broke out in February. Thomas Graham, welcome back. Glad to be here. 
Well, it has been a while. My loyal listeners, those who've been with me since the very beginning, might remember you you joined me back in early 2021. We talked about the Navalny arrest and how Putin has managed to stay in power. Here we are nearly two years later. I have been dealing with the issue of autocracy on the podcast recently, China and the COVID protests, Iran right. and the public outrage over the death of Masa Amini uh, by the morality police. Well, here we have a Putin's Russia. He seems to be steering his nation toward the cliff, a war that he started that he can't seem to win or extricate himself from. Why haven't Russia's elites turned against Putin? Well, you know, that's a very good question. I think, you know, I would start by saying that many of the, the people in the elites were initially supportive of the war. Those that had their doubts uh, still thought that Ukraine in some way opposed a threat to, to Russia's security, to its national identity in some way. Uh, and while the war is clearly not going as planned at this point, there's still not a widespread belief that this is inevitably ends in a defeat for Russia. Now that they are involved in this conflict, even if they have certain doubts about uh, how much sense it makes, uh, they don't want their country to be humiliated. So they're prepared to stick it out for a while longer. And only if the situation gets radically worse over the next several months do I think you begin to see some thinking about how we move away from Putin and perhaps put the country on a different course. Trying to figure out how power works in Russia, how Putin's government functions. It's important to try to identify who we're talking about here, not by name necessarily. But when we talk about the elites in Russia, we're talking about big business, the military, state media, security services, ideologues. Who are we talking about? Well, we're talking about all of them uh, to some extent or another. You know, the important point to remember is that all these groups that we talk about are hardly monolithic. Uh, there's a tendency to think that you've got a group of what we call power ministers, and they all think alike, that they're all rabid nationalists, that you have a more liberal sort of big business community, those oligarchs that enjoy lucrative ties with the West that have been sanctioned and therefore are dissatisfied with the conflict. Uh, they're split within those groups. Some support the war. Some would like to see a more aggressive approach to the conflict. And there's, again, there's a third group that would really prefer to see a way out of the conflict, some sort of negotiated settlement that would bring this conflict to an end as quickly as possible. People in a wide number of fields, but the important thing to remember is it is a very small stratum of, of Russian society. We're talking about uh, at most uh, 1%, probably a little bit less of that than that of the entire Russian population, which is about 145 million people at this point. And I'm trying to get my mind wrapped around how a course correction could occur in Russia. So take the United States. You used to be on the National Security Council, if I'm not mistaken, during the George W. Bush administration. Right. That is an advisory panel to the president on issues of national security. So that's one influence point, if you will. We have congressional elections in multiple political parties here. We can vote out the president every four years and put somebody else in who, say, wants to get the country out of the war. Public opinion matters in our country. I mean, there's all different nodes of influence, right? Right. But in Russia, who is Putin listening to? Is he listening to his military? Are they even giving him good advice at this point? From what I've been told by other experts on my podcast, he's surrounded by yes-men and sycophants. You know, to a certain extent, that's true. But the point that I would stress is that despite the fact that the system obviously works in a radically different fashion from our own, Putin still operates in a political context. He doesn't have a free hand to do any just anything that he wants. He doesn't have a magic wand. There are a lot of different centers of influence, centers of sort of limited power that he has to manage properly to maintain his own position. You know, we've mentioned some of them. The military clearly serves as an institution, but with that regard, the special services, elements of the business community are all important. And he needs to keep those various elements in balance as a foundation for his own power. Uh, and as he narrows his circle of advisors, he runs the risk of being out of touch with various groups that, as I said, in the long run are essential to his ability to exercise power throughout the Russian system. You know, and the final point here is that public opinion does matter. You know, not exactly in the way it might in the West. They don't have free and fair elections. It's unusual for the 
uh, the electorate to vote against a candidate that's approved by the Kremlin. But the Russian president has to act in ways that do not stir up mass discontent. You know, the way I like to put it is that a Russian president has three basic tasks. The first is that he's supposed to protect the elites from foreign enemies. Second, he needs to protect the elites from the masses. Uh, and third, he needs to protect the elites from themselves. That is, he needs to manage ably the competition among the elites. And if he can't perform those three functions, then the elites will find a new leader. We haven't reached that point with Putin yet. There are various scenarios that could play themselves out over the next several months or, or few years that might lead the elites to, to come to a different conclusion uh, and try to find a replacement for Putin. And it may happen sooner than many people had anticipated a couple of years ago. Wow. So that is the mechanism for replacing Russia's leader. The elites would have to get together and decide on a replacement. But again, in our country, you have an election and we know how our succession works in the United States. The succession of Russian rulers historically has been a mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, going back to know, the czars. Know, well, it wasn't a mess. Okay. Uh, in the czarist period, it was quite clear what happened. You had a czar, you had an heir. Um, That's right. You're right. Yeah. And, you know, once the czar died, the heir took over and made some adjustments, but basically kept the system intact. Now, there, are, you know, there are a few historical examples of not quite working out that way, where. We had a bad air. <laughs> well, not a bad air, but where some forces around the czar decided that he wasn't adequate and pushed him aside in favor of someone else. But again, it was in the line of of succession. It isn't as they pulled someone out of the uh, out of the blue uh, and put him or her in that position. But Catherine the Great, for example, succeeded after her husband uh, was basically murdered. So. These things happen, but she was a logical person to replace uh, a departed czar at that point. You know, it became a little bit more difficult during the Soviet period, although, again, and the succession had to be worked out within the councils of the Communist Party. And you did get periods of instability when one leader died and another had to emerge, but had to consolidate power over a certain period of time. Uh, you know, we have something similar in the current period, although we have a constitution that technically regulates succession, replacements of individuals. We're talking about uh, the Russian the constitution. Think, you know, the Russian constitution obviously can be amended. Putin has amended it, but it does provide a framework. So there is a, a way of pushing Putin aside uh, and then having a, an election in 2024. Okay. The next presidential elections are, are scheduled for, uh, for the spring of 2024 and produce a new leader. Now, you're not going to have a free and fair election. This is in a situation where if the elites get tired of Putin, they're going to say, well, let's run three or four candidates and see what the public wants. They will have to have the struggle among themselves to focus on a single candidate that will be put forward and almost invariably will be elected president by the public. You know, one of the things that does keep Putin in power and one of the sources of his strength is it's very difficult to get all these competing elites to agree on a successor. And, you know, it's easier to sort of manage a system where you're familiar with all the, the various aspects of it than to try to put a new leader in place. And then you have to reform all the networks uh, that provide you with a, a standing in this elite element of the Russian political system. Well, I appreciate that answer because I've been trying to figure this problem out uh, with other guests. And I overstated the case about the czars there. So thank you for correcting me on that front. There seemed to be a better set of checks, if you will, on Khrushchev with the Politburo than there is around Putin right now. The Soviet leadership after Stalin's death was genuinely collective. You know, Khrushchev never wielded as much power as Stalin did. Mm -hmm. And there were always checks on his authority and his power within the within the Politburo. And they got rid of him, too. So. And remember, and then Khrushchev actually was thrown out of yeah. power by a palace coup uh, in 1964. And then you had another collective leadership. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a single individual that rises at to be the first among equals. But nevertheless, there are significant checks and balances on that individual. It works a little bit that way in the current period not through an institutionalized belief bureau, but as I said, you've got uh, these various elements of the elites, you've got various powers of center, you've got the special services, uh, you have the military, big commercial entities like Gazprom, Rosneft, the national champion in the oil sector, for example. 
those individuals have to be kept on board for Putin to exercise his power. I'm glad you mentioned that Putin does not have a magic wand. I've been talking a lot about dictators recently, too. I had Ian Kershaw on the podcast, the great Hitler biographer. You know, Hitler was aloof to the minutia of government, but of course he did make all the key decisions. Seems to me that Putin does make all the key decisions, but unlike in any government, dictatorship or democracy. You have bureaucracies. I mean, no one person just stands in an office with the words dictator written across, you know, the front of the door, dictating every single thing that happens. You do need some base of support. Well, Uh, it's a modern society. It is a complex organism. There's no individual that could run this on his or her own. Obviously, you need other people to do that. There are thousands of things, millions of things that happened uh, during the day that aren't all that important to you that, yes. that you're not going to pay attention to. I think the important point here is that someone in Putin's position does have the ability to influence anything that is happening in a significant way, but he has to decide that it's in his interest to uh, to try to impact that particular decision one way or another. At the Council on Foreign Relations, the official publication is Foreign Affairs. There's an article in there, Russia's Missing Peacemakers, written by Tatiana Stavanaya. And she talks about how in Russia there are these ultranationalists or nationalists or hardliners who want to see victory all the way to the end. They still think that Russian forces can reach Kiev. She also says there are realists who want Russia to freeze the conflict in Ukraine right now. But both of these groups, if we can say there are just two groups, agree that if Russia loses the war, it could lead to state collapse. And they're not just defining losing as all Russian troops driven out of Ukraine, which, of course, would be a defeat. They're saying that even if Russia agrees to pull back to the front lines of February, that is defeat and it could lead to state collapse. What is state collapse in this context? What do you think of that analysis? Well, I mean, it's it's somewhat a mystery to me why they think that way. You know, it's hard to know what they mean exactly by a strategic defeat right now. You know, it is very unlikely uh, under any scenario that Ukraine is going to invade Russia. They may take back regions that Russia has illegally annexed, but I don't think that most Russians really have warm feelings from any of those places at this point. Yeah. You know, Crimea is something of an exception. Yeah, it's tricky uh, there. Given the, given the role that Crimea has, has played in the Russian imagination over the past couple of centuries. Nevertheless, I mean, this isn't a case of hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers uh, invading parts of Russia and occupying cities and making a drive on Moscow. Um, so why this would lead to the collapse of the state and what that would look like is a mystery, quite frankly, to me. You know, all that said... Are you uh, worried about state collapse? No, I'm not worried about state collapse at uh, at this point. But again, looking at this from the perspective of some Russian leaders, members of the elite, there are a couple of things here uh, to bear in mind. First is historical memory. Military defeats certainly in the last century, did have dramatic political consequences. Think about the war in Afghanistan, and that, I think, is conflated with the series of events that eventually led to the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. Think about the consequences of the First World War, the collapse of the defeat on the on the Eastern Front, the collapse of the czarist regime, a provisional government comes in for several months, and then you have the Bolshevik Revolution, or coup d'etat, uh, whichever descriptor you, you prefer. And that obviously leads to a radical change in Russian society. You go back a little bit far, you have the Russo-Japanese War, a major defeat in the Far East. In fact, the first time a an Asiatic power defeated uh, a European power in the modern period. And that led to a series of revolutionary developments inside Russia. Uh, and eventually the Tsar granted some sort of a constitution. You know, if we're defeated then it means that something consequential has to happen to the domestic political system. I think there's another factor here as well, uh, and it's hard to sort of get your hands around it, that the sense that a defeat will lead to the collapse of uh, of the Russian state, I think is a sign that the elites themselves have less confidence that they have a right to run Russia, that in fact they are uh, making a mess of things or they're in some way, they gain their positions through illegitimate means, and they expect the wrath of the people. 
to play a role if this mystique of the state is cracked in some way. It's not all powerful. It's not successful. Then the people revolt in some way because they have been oppressed in significant ways over the past many years. So I think these two elements is what factors into the uh, imagination of Russians near the center of power when they talk about state collapse. Now, what it would look like, what they imagine, I don't know. It is very unusual for a state that is as ethnically homogenous as Russia, it's about 85% of the population is ethnic Russians, to collapse. I just don't know of another historical example. uh, And that's already taken place in 1991 when the Soviet Union... No, but the Soviet Union wasn't ethnically homogenous. That's right, that's what I meant. It fragmented. It's a hundred of different... And you had Ukrainians yes. and the Russian and the Soviet Union split along the lines of ethnically based republics. Ukraine, Belarus, Kazakhstan. Um, yeah, that was my point. We, we saw that fragmentation. It made sense. I mean, you're right. Today, right. Russia... And you can see it break up. But I don't see that, uh, that happening here. It is hard to imagine uh, elements of the Russian state on their own being viable. What has become a very competitive world at this point. So... A period of instability as Russia goes through a leadership transition of some sort, perhaps a generational shift in leadership, absolutely, but something that leads paralysis of Russia, the collapse of the state, and the appearance of several new states, I think, is highly unlikely. And no one should be rooting for that either, because that could spell... Many problems for the world. (laughs) Yeah, well, again, that is something to bear in mind. You know, the U.S. government was very concerned about the breakup of the Soviet Union, in part because they have a nuclear arsenal. And what happens with those nuclear weapons in a scenario of collapse is a big question, but the likelihood that they will wind up in the hands of individuals who prefer not to have them is also an obvious concern. Uh, But, you know, at the end of the day, the United States, out of its own self-interest, needs some, some government that can effectively govern this vast territory. It's not only the nuclear weapons, there are tremendous resources located on that territory. Uh, it plays a large role in the whole issue of climate change. And without effective government across that vast territory, you're going to buy yourself a host of problems that will only exacerbate uh, the various problems that we face at this point. And that concern about the collapse of the USSR is why President Bush, H.W. Bush, went to Kiev in what, 1990, 91, and gave right. his chicken Kiev speech. What he did was warn about going too quickly to independence. But you just answered my next question as to why Putin and his supporters in Russia view the war as one of self-preservation. They don't see it as a war of aggression the way we do, and I think we correctly see it as a war of aggression. Whatever one thinks of NATO enlargement post-1991 and that being a factor here, or who's to blame for the failure of the Minsk agreements 2014-2015, this is a war of aggression. But Russia sees it as one of self-preservation, meaning defeat doesn't just mean defeat. You go back to the status quo. It means that the world as we know it changes for good. As you just explained, historically, there's a lot there in the Russian imagination. Is it possible to discern where public opinion is right now, considering Russians don't really get the same information we get about what's going on? Well, they don't get the same information. They get a different set of information, but that doesn't mean they don't have opinions. So they're, they're going to look at it through different, a different set of eyes. Now, in a political society such as Russia, uh, you always have to take uh, opinion polls with a grain of salt. There are obvious costs to be paid for giving the wrong answers to certain questions. But, you know, the public opinion polling that we've seen, including from those that we still consider reliable, that conduct these polls according to Western standards, the overwhelming bulk of the Russian population supports the war. Now, I think that support is passive uh, as long as it doesn't impact directly on their own lives Uh, You know, why would they be opposed to what the Kremlin wants to do? Again, this is one of the reasons you've got the reaction to the mobilization that you did. All of a sudden, Putin announced that 300,000 Russian men uh, who thought they were never going to be involved in this conflict are going to be involved in the conflict. That requires real sacrifice. And tens of thousands of Russian men fled the country to avoid the conscription. And the Kremlin has been very careful not to call this a war, it's a special military operation. 
uh, still create the impression that most of the country really isn't going to have to sacrifice much for this conflict. Again, that's one of the reasons you have growing concern by the military. If you're going to turn those around, you require perhaps more conscripts. You have to put the economy on a war footing. And that begins to uh, impinge upon the, the lives of millions and millions of Russians in a way that is perhaps not seen in a favorable light by those Russians, particularly since the Kremlin hasn't been able to, to convince the, the masses of the population that they're actually fighting for the survival of Russia. This is in the Second World War, where the, you know, the Nazis are at the gates of Moscow, surrounded Leningrad, which is now St. Petersburg. And you really are talking about the survival of the Soviet Union as a state. This is somewhat quite different at this point. Final point here, there was internal polling from the Kremlin that leaked out quite recently that showed that there is declining support for the war, but it's still at very high levels, well over 50% of the population. But the curious element here is that even those people who now believe that it was a mistake to have launched this uh, war against Ukraine, in overwhelming numbers, still believe that the Russians now need to prosecute this war to a successful end. So we got into this mess. Uh, we shouldn't have got into this mess. But now that we're in this mess, we need to continue in, in, until we have some sort of victory. Like so all countries. You've got a paradoxical situation. And quite frankly, I think that is true of much of the elite as well. I was actually in Moscow uh, back in in May of this year, and was surprised to find how little enthusiastic support there was for this, at that point, special military operation. Nevertheless, you didn't find any officials that were begging or hoping that Russia would be defeated. Yeah, they didn't want their country to be humiliated, and they were going to see this through to the end. And I know that in Ukraine, there were tensions over language and other issues between ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians, but there was no really deep-seated dislike or hatred among ordinary people. They didn't want this war. Putin had been a fairly shrewd and ruthless operator prior to this when it came to Chechnya, Georgia, some of the other wars of Soviet succession, if you want to call them that. He knew not to go too far. Why do you think he so badly miscalculated this time? In a word, hubris. You know, Putin has been around for a long, long time. You know, he has seen Western leaders come and go. You know, even the time when he was prime minister uh, and Medvedev was president you know, more than a decade ago, it was still widely considered that he was the power behind the throne. And, uh, you know, I think over the past couple of years, he looked at Western leaders with a certain amount of disdain. So if you just take the past couple of years, you know, we had a very chaotic exit from Afghanistan. And certainly that would have led Putin to see President Joseph Biden is less than a stellar leader at that point, someone who probably wasn't prepared to stand up to what he might do in Ukraine. Boris Johnson, the, the prime minister of the United Kingdom, mired in all sorts of scandals. Angela Merkel, a leader for whom Putin had a modicum of respect, was stepping down and in her place for stepping individuals, you know, quite frankly, weren't inspiring as, as international leaders. And French President Macron has been around and says a lot of things, but much less action uh, put behind that rhetoric. Talking uh, about a European a, army when Macron has talked about forming like a European Yeah, exactly. Army. So how's the European army uh, <laughs> looking at this point? Well, they haven't lost uh, any people yet, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they haven't put any people in place either. So it's um, uh, so he looked around and didn't see great leadership in the West. Uh, he thought Western society was becoming decadent. You know, and that had been a plank of his political platform for years. You know, this focus on what he would call traditional Christian values, family values that are the backbone of Russian society. These were under attack in the West by what he considered a decadent elite. And then he also believed that, you know, the money had poured into modernizing the Russian military over the past decade uh, had produced a capable modern military force. And he looked at the way they performed in 2014 in seizing Crimea, the way they performed in 2015 when he sent some of the, uh, the troops into Syria, and thought that this pretty much would be a cakewalk. So he underestimated Western leadership. He overestimated the capabilities of his own military. And he grossly underestimated the will of the Ukrainian people to resist and the skill with which they could re resist Russian advances. A military operation 
which in his mind was supposed to be a blitzkrieg over in a couple of weeks, has turned into a prolonged war of attrition. Could he have had better intelligence? Perhaps. Again, one of the problems in a system like this is that the intelligence tends to get corrupted as it moves up. People are inclined to send forward what they think the leadership wants to hear rather than an objective assessment of the conditions on the ground. So bad intelligence combined with hubris on the part of Putin has led to what so far looks to be a disaster for Russia. The great military historian Antony Beaver on this podcast a few weeks ago said the new Russian tank, all that money that Putin and the military put into developing this new Russian tank, it's only good for going on parade in Red Square. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that is part of the problem. But look, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of corruption in Russia as well, and that affects the military. So, you know, a lot of the money that was intended to modernize the military to bring the forces up to snuff uh, in terms of tactics and so forth went for other purposes. So significantly less was actually spent on modernizing the military than and Putin might have, might himself have thought. Hmm. So I will ask you a question that I've asked all of the experts I've had on for the last nine, 10 months about this matter, about what is driving Putin, what are his motivations. Some say, you know, he's a Marxist-Leninist interested in bringing back the Soviet Union. I don't believe that. He's a nationalist. He is a kleptocrat, only interested in his own power and wealth. I think the most convincing description is what Michael Kimmage used on my show some weeks ago. He is a Russian state builder. He is interested in not conquering all of Europe like Hitler. He's not committing genocide in Ukraine, even though there are, of course, atrocities. That this is about what's happening in Russia and Ukraine and their unique history in the post-Cold War order, which, of course, has shaped Putin's outlook. He is interested in Russian state power, not a fascist, not all these other things. Well, you know, I tend towards Michael Kimmage's view of this, but, you know, I would put it perhaps in a somewhat broader historical perspective. The challenge that has faced Russian rulers for centuries now is how do you defend a vast, sparsely populated, multi-ethnic, multi-confessional country on a territory without formal physical barriers that also abuts powerful states or unsettled territory. Uh, and the way the Russians have sought security throughout the centuries is through what we would call strategic depth, that is pushing the borders as far away from the heartland as possible, buffer zones, regional hegemony of some sort, strict internal control, uh, and the disruption of the formation of any hostile coalitions along its borders. And that plays itself out throughout history. And Russian expansion is not unlimited, but Russian expansion ends when it meets countervailing forces or when the balance between external security and internal security is appropriate. You know, the problem is the farther you expand, the more sort of disparate elements you bring into the country that makes it more difficult to govern. Russian rulers have always had to decide between how much they were going to spend on garrisoning the state, maintaining internal order, and how much they were going to put to guaranteeing or securing their external security. And they always shifted back and forth depending on where the threat was at, at any particular moment. And so it is a search for security that is an element of state building, I would argue. Uh, and I think that where Putin is uh, at this point, Ukraine itself has occupied a special role in the, in the imagination of Russians. Absolutely. Uh, for a number of reasons. You know, rightly or wrongly, they consider Kiev and Rus as the foundation of Russian statehood historically. That grew up in the territory of what is today's Ukraine, spread farther afield. Ukraine or the territory of present day Ukraine became a very important buffer zone for Russia in the 18th and 19th century against initially the Poles to the west, nomadic tribes and the Turkish em or the Ottoman Empire uh, to the south. And when Catherine the Great conquered much of that territory, in the late 18th century, and next Crimea in 1783, that put an end to many of the nomadic raids from the south, uh, and also put Russia in a better position to deal with both the Ottoman Empire, and at that point, a sort of weakening Polish entity to the west. Ukraine, particularly the Donbass region, uh, which is the one that is at the center of this conflict right now, 
became in many ways the industrial heartland uh, of the Russian Empire. Uh, a lot of coal, a lot of steel, the modern sinews of state power were located in Ukraine. The agricultural lands there as well provided a uh, bounty for, for the Russian Empire. Uh, export of grain was a tremendous earner of foreign exchange at that point. Uh, and I think it's right or arguable that if, if that part of the Russian Empire had been removed in the late 19th and early 20th century, Russia certainly wouldn't have been a great power on the scale of Germany, France, Italy, Great Britain at, at that time. And then there's a final sort of curious element here as well. In the late 19th century, as you know, we had a period of, of nationalism. And the great empires had a solid nationalist core. France, Germany at that time, Germany had been united in the middle of the century, but then began to expand outward. Uh, the English uh, as part of the British Empire. And those empires that were multi-ethnic, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, were really waning and losing their power. Russia clearly wanted to be considered one of those great empires that had a solid nationalist core. But if you look at the demographics of the Russian Empire in the late 19th century, only if the Ukrainians could be considered Russians would Russians have formed more than a majority of the population uh, of the Russian Empire. Wow. Without the Ukrainians, ethnic Russians were about 44 percent of the population of the Russian Empire. You throw in the Ukrainians, you throw in the Belarus, the white Russians, and then it's three quarters of the population. So. It was important to keep Ukraine as Russians and keep the territory of Ukraine in Russia if you wanted to make the argument that this was a great empire based on a solid nationalist core. So that also impacted the imagination of Russians. In the 20th century, although during the Soviet period, you did get the distinct Ukrainian national identity and distinct Russian identity within the, within the Soviet Union, it's still quite through that the Ukrainians and the Russians, in a sense, ran the Soviet Union as a joint venture. Ukrainians played a considerable role in the upper echelons of power, in the military, uh, in other positions that were critical to holding the empire together or holding the Soviet Union together. So for all these reasons, Ukraine is an important element of the Russian national identity and keeping it close to Russia were in some sort of political association with Russia, much of the Russian elite considers critical to Russia's own security, its own sense of national identity. And that provides, I think, the historical backdrop to what we see happening in Ukraine today. And this history you just detailed here is why I reject this framing you see in the West a lot about how the war today is a a part of a struggle between autocracy and democracy, a global war. It's about Russia and Ukraine. And, and my final observation, final question here is, of course, the war is unjustified. Of course, there's no excuse. Whatever one thinks of NATO enlargement, that whole debate, nothing can justify what Vladimir Putin and Russia are doing to Ukraine. But from listening to you, it sounds like what you're saying is that Russia has legitimate national security interests of its own here. I'll give you an example. In 2007, when you were still on the National Security Council at the Munich Security Conference that year, you'll recall, of course, what Putin said about putting Ukraine into NATO, etc. Now, some people say that's just propaganda, that he's invading Ukraine, not because he's worried about NATO enlargement. There are other reasons there. You know, whatever. I, I still think we have to address this issue of Russia's own national security interests and not just dismiss them out of hand. Well, I think that's absolutely right. If you want to have an enduring structure of peace in, in Europe, uh, then you have to minimally satisfy what Russia sees as its own legitimate security interest. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to give them everything that they want. No. Um, there's obviously a class of interest here. But you're not going to be able to solve the problem uh, unless you can exercise what we would call strategic empathy. And that is being able to put yourself in the shoes of the Kremlin uh, at this point, see the world through their eyes, see what their threat perceptions are, what their concerns are, how they think about security, and then try to uh, see if there are ways that you can accommodate some of that uh, in order to satisfy them, to make them feel less threatened than they do at this point. Not an easy task, 
there are clear differences of yeah. uh, views on this. And now there's blood has been but, spilled. So, yeah. but you know, when you if you bring an enduring piece, uh, nobody gets everything that they want. Everybody has to be minimally satisfied that their interests have been taken into account, uh, and that gives you the most enduring piece. If you try to uh, simply ignore them, even if you inflict a significant defeat on Russia at this point, the resentment will build and you'll have to deal with this in the future. That's sort of the lesson of the peace at, at the end of the First World War that played directly into the rise of Nazism. So finding that solution uh, does require us to sort of acknowledge that Russia has legitimate national interests, try to understand the way they conceive of their na national interests, and as I said, factor that in uh, to our policy going forward. So far away from getting to any type of stable situation now, though, because of this war. And who knows how long it's going to last and how far it will escalate. My final, my final, final thought, uh, paraphrasing President Clinton near the end of his presidency, he said something like, and, and this quote appears in Mary Elise Cerati's book, uh, Not One Inch. He said something like, you know, without a stable Russia that's part of the international community, the world will know misery. <laughs> You know, Russia is located in a part of the world where it can uh, project power and pathologies to all the other important centers of power on the globe, with the possible exception of, uh, of North America. So what happens in Russia is never confined to Russia itself. It does have uh, implications for, for global, uh, global security. So, you know, no matter what we might think about Russia, no matter what we might think about the state of Russian power at this point, it's not a problem that we uh, that we can ignore. We need to develop a way of interacting with Russia uh, that stabilizes the situation along its borders, but also creates a world in which our own security, our own prosperity are not as threatened as they are uh, by certain things that happen in and around Russia today. Thomas Graham of the Council on Foreign Relations, we thank you. And I want to thank all of you who listened to this podcast. This is the final episode of 2022. We'll be back in the first week of January with new episodes for people who want to think about current events historically. And sign up for my weekly newsletter at historyasithappens.com. Happy New Year.